glad you joined me once again to look into the perfections of God. Today I would like to explore the aseity of God. Aseity simply means the ability of existing in and of oneself. The term aseity comes from the Latin phrase a se, meaning from or by himself. Let me share with you a bit of contrast in order to help us fully understand what aseity is and how it pertains to the triune God. You and I were procreated by our parents. Our parents were procreated by their parents. And when you peel back the, under, the onion of human uh, history, we find all our origins uh, in the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. But likewise, Adam and Eve came into existence by a creator, and that creator is God. Now, God in contrast, that is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were not created. They have always existed. It can rightly be stated and believed that God is the uncaused cause and the uncreated creator. The aseity of God was clearly expressed by him to all mankind through his encounter with Moses at the burning bush. And we find this in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. God says this to Moses. Well, I should say that Moses writes, God, God said to Moses, uh, suppose I go to Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? And listen to what God said to Moses. He says, tell the people of Israel, I am who I am. That is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. In this statement or reply uh, to Moses, God was explaining to Moses that his name reveals who he is. And, and, and what he is as well. When he says, I am that I am, he's simply and profoundly stating this, that he has always been and he always will be. So we can rightly say that there was never a time when God did not exist and there will never be a time when God will cease to exist. Moses, understanding this, wrote in Psalm chapter 90, verses 1 and 2. He says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or even you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Did you hear that? From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In other words, there is never a time when God did not exist. From eternity to eternity, God has always been. Since this is the case with God, it can rightly be stated, first this, God has no beginning and therefore no end. Unlike you and I, we have a beginning and we most certainly have an end, but God has no beginning and God has no end. And because God has no beginning and no end, God does not change. He has no need to change and he will never be compelled to change. Three, God is equally conscious of past, present, and future. Why? Because he created time and therefore sits above it and controls it. Furthermore, God is not limited by the passing of time and what he can accomplish. God can accomplish all things at, in every single moment as he chooses. And fourth, because of the aseity of God, God is not controlled by his creation, but is sovereign over his creation. Dr. John Frame, a now retired professor and author of many books, including systematic theology textbooks, teaches this regarding the aseity of God. He says, the Bible teaches that God is a se, which is the Latin term for um, aseity. I should say it's, it's, it's where we derive the word aseity from, the Latin term a se. And so God, uh, the Bible teaches us that God is uh, self-existent by teaching that God is the owner of all things, the possessor of heaven 
and earth. Think about that. If God is a God that never had a beginning and never had an end, or I should say never has an end, that and he creates, then everything that he creates is his, right? And this proves the fact that he is eternal. Psalm 24 verse 1 says this, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and those who dwell therein. Because God is self-existent, God controls all things and God owns all things. Psalm 50 verses 10 to 12 makes this abundantly clear. It says this, For every beast of the forest is mine, says the Lord, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. This is what God says to mankind. And he says this to us in order that we understand that he is self-sufficient and self-existent. But Professor Frame goes on to say this. He teaches God is the owner because everything other than God is his creation. Creatures do have possessions of their own, but only by divine gift. We, when we give something to God, we give him only what he has first given us. So when we give something to God, he has no obligation to reimburse us. God owes us nothing at all. And then he quotes Romans 11, verses 35 and 36. And, and he believes, and I believe as well, that this, these two verses make this point abundantly clear. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 35, Who has given a gift of God that he might be repaid? You and I, we have never given a gift to God that we might be repaid because God owns all things. And anything we give to God, we're just giving back to him that which he has entrusted to us. And then Paul goes on in Romans eleven thirty six. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be glory forever. Amen. Professor Frame finishes with this. He says, Now it is true that God puts himself under obligation to creatures by making covenants and promises. But these obligations, in other words, these covenants that God makes with man, are self-imposed upon God, not forced on him by anyone or anything outside himself. The ascetic of God is important also when it comes to worship, to the worship of God, to a life lived in the presence of God. Understanding that God does not need us, but that God wants us, therefore he created us, should cause us to understand the importance of worship. For example, understanding the, the aseity of God teaches us that unlike pagan worship, the worship of the triune God, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is not intended to meet God's needs, but is to acknowledge Him for His self-sufficiency and His sufficiency, sufficiency to meet our needs. In other words, God doesn't need our worship. God requires it. It is our duty to give God his, the worship due him, but it is us who are blessed by the worship as we ascribe to God the glory due his name. For this reason, when we worship, um, it can biblically be stated that we worship God the Father through the mediation of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. This is Trinitarian worship. It is a worship mindset that ascribes to God the glory due him from his creation. The Apostle Paul addresses this, addresses this understanding when he spoke to pagan worshipers in Athens in Acts chapter 17, verses 24 to 30. He states this, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man 
every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us, for in him we live, move, and have our being. In other words, if God did not exist, we would not exist. If God was created, and if God had a beginning and therefore an end, then we would cease to exist. Paul goes on to state this, as even some of our own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed in the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now he commands. He commands because he has the sovereign power to command his creation. He commands all people everywhere to repent. So the reality is that we depend utterly on God and God does not depend at all upon us. This is the doctrine or the teaching of God's aseity. So although aseity is a philosophical idea, our knowledge of it is like all other divine attributes grounded in the practical reality of God as our covenant Lord. We confess his aseity because such a confession is implicated in the very act of worship, in the reverence that the worshiper has for his Lord. Let me remind you once again of the connection between aseity and worship in Paul's prayer in Romans eleven thirty six. 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be glory forever. Amen. The Apostle Paul understood that God does not need us, but he wants us, and he wants us for his glory. Therefore, he calls us through his Son, his everlasting Son, to be saved and to come and to glorify him and to understand how holy he is, how transcendent he is, and how he is not bound by the same boundaries that we are, but he is from everlasting to everlasting, self-existent. There was never a time that God was not, and there's never, there will never be a time when God will not be. Finally, God has declared himself as holy, and so we have to ask ourselves this question. How does holiness fit into the aseity of God? Well, simply put, God's holiness walks hand in hand with his aseity. Because God has always been and always will be, and because he has no need for change, God and all he does will always emanate from his holy mindset. So when, um, when, when he says, when, when we hear the seraphim say to Isaiah, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is, Right? And when we hear that, we understand that that is God expressing who he is. That is God expressing who he has always been and who he always will be. Right, And so as we take in the mindset of God, the perfections of God, we've got to understand that God is calling us to understand him for who he is, not who we think he is, not who we would like for him to be, not who other people tell us God is, but who he is. And the only way to understand that is through the word of God. That's why the apostle Paul says this in Romans chapter 12, verse two, do not be conformed to this world. In other words, don't let your mind be conformed to the world around you, to the thinking of man, to the philosophy, the love of the man's wisdom. No, allow your mind to be transformed through the word of God. So he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable 
and perfect. In other words, Paul is saying, as we understand who God is, we will understand, and as I should say, as we understand all of his perfections, we will clearly understand that each and every one of his perfections is good and acceptable and perfect. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you are um, a God who has no beginning and has no end. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that because of that, you do not change. And we thank you that in your word, you state clearly that you are holy and you call us to be holy because you are holy. And so, Father, help us understand your might, your power, your sovereignty over all that you have created. Help us apply this to our lives, to our minds, to our hearts, to our wills. And Lord, I pray that you would receive all the glory of this application. For we ask these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. I hope you have been edified by this study, and I hope that you will grow in your understanding of the perfections of God as you continue throughout this study. God bless you all.